So hello everyone, uh, thank you for joining the talk here. Uh, today I'm going to mostly present the trade-offs between single phase and two phase. So uh, I'm going to talk about refrigerants a little. Uh, I, I know like there is a lot of like DLC single phase, but as a research uh, based project, I, I want to show like what we have done at Cool IT Systems on two phase direct to chip liquid cooling and the challenges that we have faced during the development, during like building a product for uh, the customer. So uh, the whole purpose of these uh, slides are to uh, elevate the level of education in the whole industry about two-phase direct-to-chip liquid cooling. So one of the things that I'm talking about is refrigerants. Uh, the second but very important topic would be the pressure drop effect, which it's going to affect the uh, saturation temperature of the coolant and also the cooling loop design, uh, series versus parallels, and some equipment sizing. So uh, there is a whole paper on all of the details published in Interpack. It's not online yet, but uh, if you touch base with me, I can send you the copy, and it will be online very soon. So uh, if you look at here, uh, you can see a very basic two-phase loop as a concept level. So you have uh, evaporator number one and evaporator number two. This can be a cold plate level. This can be uh, two uh, nodes that are in a rack, or this can be as a whole rack. It doesn't necessarily represent like a two parallel cold plate. It can be a whole system level. Uh, so you have a pump uh, that pumps the liquid refrigerant. Then it goes to the some flow control valve. Then it goes to evaporators, cold plate or nodes. And then the flow boils there and a mixture of liquid and vapor comes out and goes to a condenser and then pumps back again. And the figure on the right shows the uh, cool IT lab setup that we have in our innovation center. So uh, the first and most important thing about two-phase system design is to first select your refrigerant. Uh, th that is where everyone needs to start. You have to select, okay, I'm going to use R515B or R1234YF. Uh, that is the first block that you need to set, then build your whole system based on that. After you've done that, it is not easily swappable. So if you select your refrigerant, you cannot come back and revise at the mid of the project, say, oh, uh, let's change the refrigerant to this one. There are several factors involved that is not easy to, to do that. And then you have to also consider uh, the refrigerants are the cost of it, like one pound to one pound or one kilogram to one kilogram of those compared to PG25 based water based solutions are 10 to 12 times more expensive. Now if you look at like gallons and gallons of like refrigerants, then the cost would be highly like significant as a initial cost of investment. Then imagine if there is a leak. Yes, the servers won't damage, but then you have a chance to lose your whole highly pressurized refrigerant into the environment which is first you've lost very significant money out of that, but then you have to face lots of legal fees because you have leaked refrigerants into the environment. So there are lots of local and federal laws about how much of, like it's usually like below 10 kilogram, you have to report it this much, above 10 kilogram, you have to report to this ministry, and there, there would be some significant legal fees for those to consider. Then once you select your refrigerants, you can go with high pressure refrigerant. And with that, your whole cooling loop is a pressure vessel. Now imagine like you're, you, you have a working pressure of like 200 PSI there. And that drives up the cost of your whole system, drives up the cost of your whole cold plate, CDUs. Everything is a pressure vessel. So it, it increases the cost significantly. And the cold plates are now much thicker. It needs to tolerate a lot more pressure uh, when the flow is boiling. Now, if you go with the low pressure refrigerants, uh, then uh, there would be a significant payback on the performance, which you actually are not using any of the benefit of two phase direct to chip cooling. I'll, I'll talk about that later. And uh, if you look at historically, there are uh, historically like the GWP numbers for the refrigerants are going down and down. Like R22 has been phased out, R134A, which is very popular is being phased out. And it's all because the standard for that allows the GWP number is going down. And what if you choose like a GWP of like 300 now, but five years from now, the GWP number drops and your system is obsolete or you cannot reproduce it anymore. So uh, these are the factors that designers and 
decision makers need to consider when they are uh, designing a two-phase system. So one of the most important thing and the most challenging uh, design factor in two-phase system is the pressure drop. Pressure drop is inevitable. You cannot not have any pressure drop. There, there will be cold plates, there would be QDs, filters, manifold valves, and they all have pressure drop. That is a realistic, uh, like the, the real condition. But what will happen in two phase is that the pressure drop affects your saturation temperature and condensation temperature. I'll, I'll give you an example. And that is going to reduce the system level performance of two phase system in compared to single phase. In single phase, if you drop, if you have a pressure drop, you just have a high pump to recover that. But in two phase, the pressure drop is tied to the saturation temperature, and that has very important effect here. Let's look at this numerical example. If you have a system with R134A, and you have components QDs, it's a whole system level, and you have like 32 PSI from pump inlet to the pump outlet. It includes all of the valves, all of the QDs, all of the manifolds, cold plates, filters in the loop. And 32 PSI for the whole big system, it, it, it's a very like reasonable number. And you design your system such that your cold plate is boiling at 45 C. That is equivalent to having 168 PSI in your cold plate. Now, if you have 32 PSI pressure drop in your whole system, it means that at the end of your condenser, your saturation temperature is eight degree cooler. So it drops down the temperature from 45 to 37. So for your system to work, your condenser needs to have the inlet primary at 37, or exit primary at 37, to condensate all of the vapor back into the liquid. Now, in order to prevent the pump from cavitation, you need to subcool that. So usually like five degrees subcool is a reasonable number. So it drops down to 32 C as a temperature that needs to go out of your condenser. So uh, this is the whole point of pressure drop is tied to the saturation or condensation temperature. If you want to compare this two phase and single phase and you have your single cold plates in the lab, yes, you, there is a high chance that you see some impo per improvement on the performance. But if you look at the whole system level with the pressure drop effects considered into that, then you will see, oh, I have to pay back on the pressure drop because my condensation dropped. And why not just send the 27 C water uh, directly into the chip? That is the number that you have to look at. So the thermal resistance calculation is very complex in two-phase system. And that's why we are proposing to have a thermal resistance as T case minus the T primary inlet of your condenser. Because that is the temperature that your system requires to work. So if your system requires 27C on the condenser side as a primary to work, you have to consider that in your system. If you can manage to have zero pressure drop, then yes, you can use 45C here. But if you cannot have zero pressure drop, which is basically impossible, then you need to include all of that in your calculation. Again, in the paper, I, I talk about that very uh, deeply. But also, if you want to compare a single phase uh, system with a two-phase system, look at the thermal resistance based on this metric, and also fix all of your primary side. So if you're sending as a primary 27C at one liter per minute per kilowatt, do that for the both two-phase and single phase, and then look at the performance. Don't, don't change anything on the primary side. Keep the primary side constant, and look at your uh, secondary side or case temperatures. But again, not for single cold plate, because that's has no use in the whole industry. Look at for a mass deployment where you want to deploy your system. So uh, this is what we're proposing as a standard uh, in the two-phase industry. The other challenge would be uh, to have uh, flow routing, so series versus like parallel. So you can see that uh, many people say in the industry, oh, with the two-phase, you can put all the components in series. But usually two-phase are promoted when the heat fluxes are very high. And if you put four cold plates, 1,000 watts, each, all of them in series, then the first two cold plates are basically working on a zero or like very, like 4% and 20% vapor quality, which is basically single phase refrigerant. And that has very poor performance. 
So you cannot blindly say, oh, with the two phase, I can put all of the components in series. No, there should be an optimization uh, for the flow routing. And if you put components in parallel, then you can see that if I fix my flow rate or mass flow rate constant through the system, and I have two parallel paths, and if I increase my power in one line, the pressure drop in that line would go up. This graph shows that. Now imagine with two phase, because the higher the power, the higher the pressure drop, if you do not balance or do not regulate the flow to those lines, the line with the higher power naturally gets much less flow rate to a point that it dries out and gets to critical heat fluxes. So flow balancing is very important in two phase. So you need to add flow regulators, which at the end of the day, they add more pressure drop in the system, and then you need to pay it back in your condenser temperature. So now think of in a cold plate that has hot spot with multiple like parallel micro channel in it. What will happen there? Just, just think about that. The hot spot channels, they, they have lots of vapor produced in them and blocks the flow. So there's lots of challenges in there and lots of design needs to be considered for that. Equipment size is another challenge. In two-phase system, uh, like in, in Cool IT, we have lots of popular uh, in-rack and in-row CDUs like from like 80 kilowatt to 500 kilowatt in-rack CDUs. But if you want to com like compare the single phase two side of a plate to plate heat exchanger to a condensing side vapor that is condensing, the heat transfer coefficient on a vapor side drops a lot. That makes the heat exchanger 40 to 70% less efficient. If you want to have the same size capacity of cooling on a heat exchanger, you need to go 40 to 70 times bigger. So that occupies a lot of space. Not only that, you need to have a massive reservoir in your whole system to account for all of your hotline uh, excess fluid. So that's why like two phase CDUs are very giant. So we can have like one rack form factor of two megawatt with single phase DLC, but same thing for the like two phase can be roughly just below like 200 kilowatt maybe. So, it cannot compete on the same form factor size to the single phase. So you need to consider your footprints. Another uh, drawback of two phase, as I mentioned, is the higher uh, pressure in the system. If you are competing for performance with single phase, your natural working pressure is 30 PSI to maximum abnormal of like 70 PSI. But with two phase, I just showed, it's around like 200 PSI. So your cold plates naturally needs to be thicker. This is a simple calculation. If you have 200 watt per centimeter square, which is not a crazy high number, uh, each millimeter of copper is fi causing five degrees C increase in the case temperature. So if your single phase cold plate has one millimeter thickness base and your two phase cold plate needs to have three, then you are already losing 10 degrees C temperature there. So just think about all of this before like saying, oh, two-phase has a lot of performance benefit. Again, yes, maybe on a single coal plate, but for a whole system design, you should consider all of that. So uh, this is just, I, I explained that. So in conclusion, uh, what we are trying to say is two-phase has something to offer, but it cannot be a vastly adopted in the whole market yet and we, we don't see any benefit at this point in the time or in the next few years to say, okay, two-phase is going to be highly adopted, massively produced. Yes, there are some customers that they need two-phase for other reasons, but for the performance-wise, we have not seen any benefit on a mass deployment scale level. Again, I'm repeating it, not com comparing like component to component on a lab scale level. And with the very high performance of single phase DLC, which we have uh, recently had one product out that we were cooling 300 watt per centimeter square and total uh, chip power of uh, 1700 watt. So this is doable with single phase, we have done it and we have a lot in our horizon. So with the good promise that single phase has, uh, we don't see two phase to be vastly adopted in the market yet. By that, thank you very much.